Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our what, Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers, our supporting members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Cuyamunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars in related fields that help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this Conversation for Exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from what, neuroscience, anthropology, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, eco-spirituality, um, philosophy, psychology, mythology, shamanism. We try to cover it again. Journey, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. It's all there. From yeah. the arts to the sciences. So you're welcome to join our website at queamungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And of course, we thank you, the community members, who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamunga Institute. Today, we want to share our recent experiences from our gatherings at the Institute in June for the, for the June solstice, but I also want to continue our cultural appreciation and partnership series. We continue to celebrate ancestral traditions and the people who are helping keeping them alive. And as part of our mission, we seek to provide an environment for the encouragement of continued education, exploration, and the linking of current and traditional knowledge through celebrating the human story. Just to give you a few examples of recent discussions that we've had, uh, Alex Van, Alex Van, Van Den Heber. Dan, that's right. Okay, the, he was the Tracker Academy in, in South Africa. We had David Cumes, MD, who worked with the Sean Bushman from his homeland of South Africa. Uh, Randy Cook, a Northwest Coast First Nations artist. And uh, we've had Corrine Dempsey, a professor of religious studies, uh, talking about the spiritual traditions of Iceland. Uh, Thomas Riccio. Oh, and she brought Yoe Sigurdsson. That's right. The, the a member of that member, tradition. The tradition, yeah. right, exactly. Uh, Thomas Richo, who looks at, the, looks at the combination of rituals and theater and from indigenous cultures from South Africa, Zambia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, uh, Russia, Alaska, Korea, across the world. He's invited done, by those cultures. Invited, to work exactly. With them. Yeah. We recently had an anthropologist, uh, archaeologist Scott Ortman from the uh, University of Colorado working in collaboration documenting and protecting local ancestral sites in the contemporary Pueblo communities. Uh, Fred Smith, Professor Emeritus of Sanskrit and Classical Indian Religions, University of Iowa, and Tony Hall, our Professor of Astronomy on the construction of the solstice and equinox markers found around the world. So the Cuyamunga Institute continues to build bridges with communities globally and we recognize and seek to actively engage with the expertise of traditional bearers and educators to foster new cultural, cross-cultural pathways to enrich our cultural understanding and appreciation and ultimately the connection. Well, we continue that. Um, John Matthews coming up next, next month on the early Celtic traditions. James Herod will join us soon on the art of the Clovis cultures and the Paleolithic cultures of Europe. And you may wonder why we're so fascinated by this. And if I may speak on behalf of so many of us who feel that we are born a little out of place, um, we feel we're not quite a great fit into our own culture, <laughs> that our current worldview for Western Civ is disjointed, contradictory, missing half of the foundation that supported earlier cultures, and that this imbalance has brought us to teeter on the brink. Uh, because our influence upon the world is, of course, informed and shaped by our worldview. And if we're going to turn this around, we need to have a direct and a personal relationship, not just intellectual, but a personal relationship with the world. That's a missing piece for us. And that the better one understands the inner workings of the world around us, that sees us as part and parcel of this evolutionary force of 13.8 billion years that created the cosmos we live in and ourselves, that is to better know our larger self and our place in it. 
We seek an ordered universe with this eternal dance of order and chaos that's always at play. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to know that someone is at home and that there's some rhyme and reason behind it. And that we can seek to help restore harmony and balance in some small way. Mm -hmm. We choose a side. What team are we playing for? So given our own fractured worldview, you can see why we would turn to the elders and the wisdom traditions around the globe, past and present, to those who came before, who successfully navigated all manner of challenges. As modern day solutionaries, we can have and we must have many teachers and many guides who can share the principles and the insights that they've employed, not just to survive, but to thrive. Mm -hmm. And even with our two hours today, we're only going to stretch the surface with these talks. It's quite the process to momentarily step outside our own culture and its blinders to glimpse the world through the lens of another. But we join hands in making sense of our world. Cooperation. So many of our guests have become advisors to this institute. And again, we thank our today's guests, Christine and Todd Van Poole, for that, for being advisors as we welcome them back. We thank them for the many talks on matters not just of interest to anthropologists, for the study of ourselves is something that we are all engaged in all the time. I just appreciate the broad and historical and innovative perspective that they bring and that they're a husband and wife team. We appreciate couples who work closely together, and we highly recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. And the classes the that they, uh, the classes they, all the time, <laughs> the classes that they teach at the University of Missouri, they are training a new generation of anthropologists, and we appreciate that they're incorporating this work, our institute's work, among their leading edge and groundbreaking work. We had the pleasure of working with Christine and Todd over the last two years by Zoom yeah. and of meeting them finally for the first time in person at our Institute Solstice Gathering. And uh, we want to welcome you both back again. Thank you for all the good work that you're doing. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. All right. Good. Yeah. So and we have many people here today who were at our Solstice Gathering. And I think um, that that is a real good place to start this discussion because okay. Part of it for me is engaging that personal and direct uh, relationship with our Mother Earth, with our planet, that it responds back to us. And we certainly saw that. We certainly saw that in the rainbows, the, the rains, the thunder beings, the, the sun showing up when it did through the clouds, through the, the clouds uh, lined up along the Santa Cristo Mountains. That land of the Institute is magically and uh, beautifully responsive to us right. in, in all of its beauty and glory. So we want to share that with, uh, with today. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can find here. Let me make sure I get my slideshow ready to go. Well, first of all, when we arrived at the Institute, it was really close to the full moon. So um, we had um, the original group of people arrived, friends of ours from, from the Sedona, Arizona area. And so they came and joined us first, the, the first batch, who wouldn't be able to stay all the way to the solstice, but they wanted to at least come but for the nightly, full moon. But nightly, we sat and watched the moon rise Oh, it was just incredible, together. the moon yeah. over, over the land and Even the she wore a mask. That yeah. <laughs> Speaking of masks, good point, yeah. Laura. Yeah, and then we went up to Tony's Noman, and we looked at the, the alignment. Of course, I kind of made up this alignment by moving the camera, but it, the idea was is to be able to, to honor the, the Noman area, which we'll be talking about which later. Which would be the key uh, point of our solstice celebration. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, the sun sets. We all went to the top of the ridge to watch the sun going down. It was just so powerful and beautiful. Uh, this was taken by Bianca, who took a picture of the pre-celebration uh, for the summer solstice. And so that was quite a, a nice, beautiful photograph to take. And then that next day, and we were doing a solstice di uh, dinner, a pre-dinner, um, and here comes the, the rainbow. And this became and, and this became very significant because I don't know how familiar you are with this area of the country, but it was, uh, I've ne and, and all the years that I've been going there, I've never had a continuous, cloudy, rainy kind of experience in cool weather the entire part of June during yeah. during that week so it was really quite special to have that 
um, we still were able to get up in the morning and, and greet the sun and have the sun come through and speak to us in different ways, but watching the cloud movement, which we're going to talk about today. And then we, then the day after, we see this cloud formation. And if you look at the bottom of the screen along the land, you see this long uh, cloud formation following the land. And I always remember as a student of Dr. Goodman back, back in the 1990s of her saying, ah, she would say, the serpent clouds. The serpent clouds. This, this is a good omen for today. And, and this cloud was, you could actually watch it moving across. It was very interesting as it undulated across the, across the uh, horizon in, in front of us. So, so we stood at the, the circle watching the clouds move across and just seeing the magic uh, of, of what was happening and being displayed in front of us. I don't know, is this a, a video? I can't remember. So, yeah, so you may not be able to see, but the clouds are moving here across. Swiftly, and too. Swiftly as well. Yeah. And our internet connection is probably such that it's pretty jumpy for you to see, but that's the idea. Then the sun bursts through as it comes up across, and you see this cloud formation happening even more so. So you see the, you see the, the uh, serpent cloud at the bottom, but then the clouds in the sky start to create on a face. Something's happening above us. And it turns into what we see with the eyeball. And the, no, this was this happened right when we were there greeting the sun. Right. And we're like, okay, it's cloudy. We're still going to get out there at dawn all together, stand at the labyrinth and greet the sun. And right when we were doing that, this opens up yeah. with the sun shining through, and it looks like a nod, yeah. right? It looks like a nod from the elements of nature. Right. It's just that, that perfect moment. It was, yeah. it was wild. Now I'm gonna back up a little bit. So here's Tony Hall and myself standing out at the Noman. And uh, we've been talking about the Noman now for more than a year. So yeah, hopefully you're familiar with the idea that you have a stick in the ground, the sun rises, the, the shadow of the stick, you place a stone at the end of that shadow and you get an alignment. Here you see the curvature of the June solstice, the rocks you see going down the center, that is the equinox. The opposite side is a curvature going the other direction. That would be the December solstice. The December solstice. So uh, this is the, the, the genius that, that Tony brought to our land. And so we have it next to our, our, our labyrinth and our, our dance A court. very ancient method of tracking the solstice and yeah. the equinox dates. Yeah. And yeah. so as we went along, of course, we, these stones were from the last time we measured. So he said, Let, now we're going to have a bunch of new people here. Let's go ahead and paint up some stones. Everybody grab some paint and some stones and let's make some and add our stones to the alignment. And so then we went back outside and added the stones. So this was a, a Frank Edge uh, who visited us. Frank Ortiz. Fr I'm sorry. Frank and he Ortiz. writes, gratitude opens the world to abundance. Abundance increases. increases our capacity for love. Love opens our eyes to the beauty that surrounds us. The beauty that surrounds us strengthens the heart, the soul, connects us deeper to spirit, to each other, to the world around us, and the cycle continues. Thank you, Frank. That was He read that, and uh, we asked him for... Uh, a written version. And because of the weather, we, 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 the rain, we decided to go inside the Thunderbird building and, and greet it with the grandfather drum. And so we all came in and had this experience of having a different sort of sunrise ritual and, and experience. Uh -huh. This is Cynthia, who's on our board of directors, uh, placing her stone, the new stones that were placed during the um, solstice. The, yeah, during the solstice, and we were doing the... the, the, the uh, Oh, and then finally, we ended with a nice roundtable discussion where you see both Todd, Christine, in addition, we have Tony. We wanted to do some mind mapping for the future, so research projects and that kind of thing. So we were able to stay an extra day and work together and, and, and lay out some ideas and fun, fun stuff. And we and, may touch on this. And like you mentioned, it was the very first time that we got to spend time with Thank the Van Pools face to face. Yeah. We spent many a time with Tony, but it's always a pleasure to spend more time with Tony. That's our our uh, labyrinth and uh, on that day and you can see it was uh, we, I think Julie's in the room she's the yeah, one that jump Julie, started that Julie thank did. you Julie and yeah. Julie we, uh, we, we hired a, a local gal from the Pueblo um, and she came up and she wanted to do some raking and cleaning she did it by immaculate I mean every weed everything is gone everything is she had it like like it was so beautiful I didn't want to walk on it <laughs> it was just spectacular anyway so that gives you kind of a quick 
uh, overview of some of that, and hopefully that leads into today's discussion as well, because I think that cloud formation really inspired us, because you know, there's that element of, one of the things that always impacted me about that part of the world is that the, uh, the sunrise is one of the most beautiful sunrises I've seen any place on the planet. But then having to, to switch gears and say, okay, now let's embrace what, what, what uh, Mother Nature has to offer us in, in terms of Thunderbird energy and, and the cloud formations and, and that kind of spirit energy. It's like a pageantry of the sky that right. comes to, to okay. bedazzle you and to interact with you. Okay, let's pass the talking stick to Chris yes. and Todd because I think we've kind of laid it out. But welcome and so wonderful to have you both here. We sure appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, growing up in the Southwest, uh, near Redoso, my young years, and in between Redoso and Capitan, I would say that you don't quite see those fast moving serpent like um, things in southern New Mexico very often. Once in a blue moon, you'll see them, but that was really amazing how the play of the landscape, the natural environment work together in a very I think a different way than it does further to the south in, in New Mexico, which was um, just absolutely fabulous to watch unfold. A lot of people from uh, Puebloan people to deep in New Mexico up into uh, northern, uh, what's now present day northern US, a lot of people, and even out here in Missouri, believe that there are serpents and the serpents live underwater, but they also come up and travel and move clouds around. That's very much a pan um, new world, new world uh, notion. And uh, the different cultures have different names and words and sensibility for these serpents. So if we were to go way before Aztec to Tehuatibacan, they probably have similar serpents. And one of our friends was Michael Cabote, and him and I talked a lot about this personally one-on-one, -on -one, and he was Hopi, and he went to Tehuatibacan, and he told me, not just me, but he told a lot of people that would be willing to listen to him, that he thought that his clan serpent came from Tehuatibacan. He was adamant about that, but that just shows how there are these long continuities with these serpents that are so important to reign. And why rain? Well, that's life-giving um, powers. It helps with the crops, grows the crops, better crops, healthier crops, better, healthier people. And so we see that through uh, Mesoamerica into the Southwest. And corn was domesticated in Central and Southern Mesoamerica. Archaeologists and geneticists have figured out their two main places in Meso where corn maize is domesticated. And I've often thought uh, as archaeologists that if you were to take corn kernels and just give it to someone, wh what would they know? And in my opinion, you need the um, rituals, the knowledge, all the pieces together. So you're not just passing, hey, here are a few corn kernels. Good luck. Yeah. Um, it's much more complex that you have to have the knowledge, the rituals, the prayers, all that has to be a package. Now, here's another curious little thing about corn. The late Linda Cordell, before she passed away, was doing genetics on corn. All these different corns you see, and there used to be a famous poster called Indian corn. Beautiful, it's in the Southwest everywhere. Corn is a grass and it um, interbreeds with the wild grasses in the region. So you get these different strands of corn. So you have Hopi that's blue corn. You have Zuni, this white sweet corn. You get the idea the Iroquois have their own corn, but that's because of the nature of the environment and because corn, maize, yes, maize, that's this Latin name, it germinates. So again, this idea of corn and serpents and all this rich cultural packages throughout um, North America, that's big probably because it comes from domesticated 7,000 years ago. I mean, people were so brilliant. They started domesticating 7,000 years ago and then it expands to the north. And so it's just amazing phenomenon. If, but corn, that's kind of serpent. if corn hybrids with the local grasses, then it's taking yes. the strengths of those local grasses for Bingo. its particular microclimate. Bingo. So. Bingo. Mm -hmm. In the Southwest, there were over 30 different varieties right. of corn grown by different groups. Um, some groups grew a whole bunch of them. Others of them sort of specialized in different sorts of corn that worked well in their local environments. Mm -hmm. But we think of corn as a, you know, a single thing. Uh, but maize, actually, there are a whole bunch of different varieties. And that's just in the Southwest alone. There are many other varieties. Uh, thinking about and going back to what you were saying, Paul, 
about the the relationship to the clouds and how they actually do look like serpents. There was yeah. a fascinating article talking about the Maya feathered serpents. The uh, there are these serpent deities around the New World, but the author there and he was Maya was pointing out how you could actually identify each stage of the Maya feathered serpent as part of their monsoon season that the Maya had, and that you could actually see the serpent coming um, through the, the, the tongue, and you could see all of these different components reflecting what was happening in the natural environment, which actually fits the insight that you're talking about there, where you look out across the landscape and it literally looks like a serpent. Mm -hmm. So these serpent traditions do in fact tie into the natural environment, the landscape, well, uh, you have explained the whole hydrology cycle as a cosmological wisdom um, in how you describe the Mayan understanding of it is, is really, you could say, science, right? It perfectly explains in mythic terms the hydrology cycle and how water moves through the environment from the atmosphere to the ground and back up again. Do you want to describe that? Because it's really beautifully insightful. Um, going back to the, the pictures Paul had, so when we were watching this at the um, labyrinth, the serpents were moving, serpent clouds were moving really fast. And in Puebloan um, cosmology and Aztec cosmology and others, you have these serpents that are underground, but they can come up and travel along the ground. And that's where we're seeing the aspect of the terrestrial mm -hmm. serpent undulating. And it was going up and it looked like it was coming up onto later to the south on the mountains like it was joining the clouds and what they do is they herd the clouds and so that they're dancing with the clouds and at one point when we were standing there watching it there's a particular type of iconographic system in the southwest that looks like a terrace and those are clouds and ancestors all clouds are ancestors in this part of the world but it's almost like it was coming up and hurting them and all of a sudden this serpent cloud left went up into the clouds behind it was these perfect step clouds, just masses of them coming forward. And it did look like what in their language might be called Kachinas coming forward. So it was like the clouds were building and coming forward. And then you see the another serpent cloud um, starting to the north, and then it would be over Palake proper, and then it would travel along the mountains and go back up. And then we see more of these uh, cumulus clouds coming out it was very much the hydraulic system where what you do is you have the serpents underground, they pop up, they travel, they herd the clouds, they push us down and around so you get the rains to drop. The rains go to the into deep into the earth and then the serpents move the underwater um, waters and then they'll actually push it up into the mountains and then it releases that underwater um underground like water to get up into the clouds and then the serpents push them up into the heavens and then you start that cycle so that's the hydraulic cycle that a lot of mesoamericans and southwestern people have that particular thing you think if you're aztec uh tolak in this part of the world you can think about their hydraulic system so yes that's kind of what we were seeing and we we're seeing that unfold on the landscape just as probably an aztec person would have seen it at 80, 1475, we were seeing something very similar here at, you know, 2022, which was so really, really astonishing to watch. Puts it into context. And it, for me, engendered this direct personal relationship. I mean, you're anthropologist, I'm an English lit major. That That's my language is, is the mythopoetic and how it adds to our relationship, our understanding, our appreciation. That is a a valid vein to understand the world. I don't have to literally believe, I can uh, mythically believe, but I can believe in the elements of nature moving in concert, in harmony, and in beauty and in grace. And um, I mean, we've always seen patterns in clouds, pattern recognition, that's what we do. That's where the gods live, right? That's where the the power lies that oversees the universe. I mean, we can we can understand that in our own Western mystical traditions. Um, also, I want to just observe that for Western civilization, we've laid so much on the serpent, right? But for the indigenous cultures the world over, he's a, she, he's a symbol of fertility, of rebirth, of renewal, 
It goes into the ground, comes up, sheds a skin, renews. The caduceus of the right. medical profession. Can you address that, please? Yeah. yeah, throughout the new world, from mezzo into the Pueblo world, the serpent's re rebirth, rejuvenation, absolutely. Well, so interesting. Uh, yeah. Why don't we go ahead and, and uh, switch oh, to Oh, I also want to say okay, the serpent ahead. mounds of Ohio <laughs> oh, yeah. and the Mississippian culture. Can right. you address that? Because you see that beautiful serpent mound with his mouth over an egg. What is it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you think it's an egg. And that's there's a lot of mysteries with that one. It's probably part of the Adena culture and was probably at some type of public ritual. But that's actually shrouded in mystery because we've lost the continuity in the oral stories with prior colonization. But anthropologists, archaeologists tend to think about the things that we know that are cross-cultural in the New World with snakes and rebirth and regeneration. But again, it's a little more subjective. Laura, you're absolutely right that the, the, the serpent tends to hold special power special significance in almost every culture where serpents are present serpents aren't always present in every culture in large part because not every place in the world has serpents there are some places that are too cold <laughs> yeah. and they they just simply aren't snakes but yeah. where they occur you do see these serpents they are as you pointed out frequently uh images of rebirth or some sort of a special transformational figure Sometimes they could be seen yeah. as dangerous in the sense of the the venomous uh, serpents that can uh, can hurt you from a hidden spot, and so they can be seen as uh, potentially dangerous. Uh, they always have some significance, and it's interesting how often they are uh, they become creatures that have special uh, powers. special powers. And so you can think about, for example, the Japanese uh, the Japanese dragons which are a form of a, a serpent. Um, you can think about Quetzalcoatl, the Quetzalcoatl uh, with the Aztec. And, and, and he's so a he's god, and other, so he's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. these other Mesoamerican sorts of serpents, and they frequently have this sort of uh, larger than the natural world sort of uh, significance uh, with, across cultures. And so look what Western civilization did with um, the serpent, you know, slaying the dragon, right? So powerful and such a feminine symbol um, as well. So it's interesting. We need to re-embrace the, the serpent, I think. Yeah, yeah and just, just the waves of energy. I mean, there's so many kind the, of... How, how energy propagates the through whole, that yeah. sinuous... It would make sense that we would have that yeah. in a visionary state uh, yeah. as an experience. Yeah. Would you like us to start our presentation? Sure, let's do that. Okay. So you raise an interesting question when you, when you ask about dancing, you ask about masks and, and whatnot. So what we're going to talk about here um, is actually a, a fairly broad cross-cultural pattern. Not every culture has uh, a mass dancing tradition, but a lot of cultures do. It's it's extremely cross uh, common cross-culturally. And so it's something we talk about in our classes when we're teaching an introduction to anthropology class or whatnot. When we're talking about these sorts of topics, though, what I like to do with, with the classes when I'm working with them is, first of all, explain why we're interested in a particular topic. Given the, the nature of this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and start at the very, very beginning about why we're even interested in it as an anthropologist and why we're interested in anthropology. And then we'll move on to talk more specifically about individual topics. But why are we, we as a culture, we as a society, interested in anthropology? And I, I tell my students, we have two answers. The first is a scientific answer and the second is a, a humanistic answer. The scientific answer is that we want to explain human behavior. At the University of Missouri where we teach, there are 26 majors within the College of Arts and Science. Almost every single one of those majors focuses on human behavior, humans in some way. You can go from philosophy to history, to poli-sci, to psychology, um, to, uh, uh, classics. to classics, to music. All of these different majors focus on humans in some way. And so we as a society, we as humans, really want to understand humans and we spend a lot of time studying humans. In fact, some of the majors that we have, which you would say, you know, normally that doesn't actually focus on humans, does focus on humans in certain regards. For example, biology also has wildlife management, which focuses on the relationship between humans and the, the environment, humans and, and um, wildlife. Mm -hmm. So we want to understand humans. One of the things we also recognize is that understanding humans requires us to understand humans across the globe and through time. We're going to understand humans. We can't just simply understand us or some small subset of humans, uh, college students or whatever. We have to actually understand humans cross-culturally around the world through time. 
that's where anthropology comes in. And so by looking anthropologically, by looking cross-culturally at humans, we can get insights into humans that we would not be able to have otherwise, we can understand something about humans that would not be evident if we only looked at any one group of humans. Now, I like human... what Ruth Benedict says, the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences, mm. to find unity in the diversity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This is the humanistic explanation or, or justification for anthropology in that we want to understand humans, not just explain human behavior, but actually understand what it means to be human and the different ways to be human. Being human isn't just a one experience, one thing we all share. We each have our own different ways of being human and each culture frames those experiences in different ways. And so there are lots of different ways to be human and understand that variation allows us to value ourselves and others in new ways. If we're only exposed to ourselves, then we think that that is all there is to being a human. And that's not quite right. There are lots of ways to be humans. And so understanding the variation, understanding the different ways that people have found to be human actually makes our own experiences uh, richer and also makes us more understanding, more tolerant, more, more uh, gives us greater insight into the other people around us, helps us be healthier. You mentioned this, Laura, when you're first talking about looking to, you know, cross cultures to try to understand uh, wisdom, to try to understand proper the behavior. Larger self. And the larger yeah. self. That's exactly right. And each culture is the result of uh, traditions that have proven to be effective. Uh, as many ways as there are to stay alive, there are even more ways to die. I also think that in order to navigate the future, we need to all join hands and put all the wisdom on the table, all the cooper cooperation on the table, understand we're one human family. Um, Absolutely. And when we look cross culture, we can get repeated themes. We can also see individual insights that will, will make our lives richer and, and provide us a way to uh, think about the world, a way to move forward in ways that are beneficial. So those are those are the two reasons why we're inter interested in anthropology, at least in a in a general sense. Now, why are we interested in religion? Religion is universal and is significant. Every culture that we have studied archaeologically, every culture that we've studied ethnographically, has the concept of religion. And within each of those cultures, there are people who are religious. Now, that's not to say that every single person in every single culture is religious. Instead, every culture has the concept of some form of supernatural and human's relationship to spirits, a spirit world, to religion, what we would call religion. Cosmic energies. Cosmic energies and so on. Every religion or every culture has that. And when the, within each of these cultures, religion matters. Even in cultures, for example, like the Soviet Union or modern day uh, communist China, which are where the government is actively trying to suppress religion and get rid of it, religion continues on. So it's universal, and it's also significant in the sense that it really impacts people's lives. A lot of times it determines who you can marry, what you can eat, the sorts of jobs you can have, your, your daily activities, when you get up, the sorts of activities you pursue during the day. Um, it's something that people value tremendously, and it structures their lives in, in many contexts. Now, of course, that varies from person to person. For some people, religion doesn't matter at all. For other people, it, it's a central characteristic. But we know I that we... we I'm sorry, I appreciate please go ahead. you have the Shaman of Trois Frères cave in France there because it's such an early instinct right. in us. So early. absolutely, yeah. we 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 see you. You mentioned the 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 um, the antlered individual there. Uh, if you look at this figure, you can see that it's an anthropomorph. It's got human hands. It's got human feet. It actually has a human face, along with being a deer of some sort or or an antlered uh, animal of some sort. We see this during that We're a costumed human, right? Absolutely. In ritual robes. Indeed. Or a transferred human that is um, yeah. having a spiritual thing where they met metamorphize into that being, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We see these sorts of images in the Upper Paleolithic, and Lewis Williams and, and others have argued that this reflects shamanism as the sort of the first religion that humans had that the, the put together a, a, a coherent view of the spirit world. We know that we have religion for at least the last 40,000 years. And it continues on into the modern day. If you look over on the, the right-hand side, the right-hand corner there, that's the Yanomamo sh uh, shaman. Uh, one of our colleagues, Napoleon Chagnon, uh, he's passed on now, but he worked with Yanomamo for, for quite a while. And he had some, some outstanding um, insights and collaborations with Yanomamo looking at shamanism and, re and religion and how significant 
religious activity was within uh, the Yanomamo daily life. And then you can take a look at the center image there where uh, this image kind of combines uh, all of the great sort of uh, the most popular at this moment, religious traditions that are, are found around the world. And it religion is important to daily life. So why is anthropology interested in religion? Well, because it, it matters to humans. And if we're trying to understand humans, we're trying to explain human behavior, we need to understand and explain religion in various ways. So then we come to mass dancers. Mass dancers are a very common component of religious expression. Cross-culturally, they're very common. Not every culture has a mass dancing tradition, but they are, they are common. And when they occur, they tend to have a particular social significance. They bind the community together in very strong, very, uh, very real ways. They give the community resilience, they create community identity, they create community structure. So when mass dancers occur, they're really, they tend to be very important. These mass dancers are often ancestors or they're other central deities. They're, they're, they're not just simply um, Santa Claus. Santa Claus, while people dress up as Santa Claus, he's not a mass dancer. That's, that's cool, that's nice, that's a costume but it's not the sort of regalia the mass dancers have. And the social significance for something like that is very different compared to the social significance of most mass dancing traditions. So these are typically ancestors or other central deities. They're common. Here on the, the left-hand side, those are some mummers. One of our colleagues, uh, Craig Palmer, worked in Newfoundland up in, in Canada. Uh, they had a mumming tradition that would be part of their uh, Christmas celebration uh, people would dress up as mummers, they'd go around, they would uh, perform activities at various houses going through the community over the course of the, uh, of the Christmas season. It was an important part of community cohesion. It's uh, based on an Irish tradition, perhaps a, a British tradition, but it looks like in this particular case, it, it's based on Irish tradition, brought over by ancestors, and it honors the community, it honors ancestors, and ultimately it honors God uh, as part of this tradition. If you look to the right there, this is a sculpture that's outside the Inn of the Mountain Gods, which is owned by the Mascalero Apache. It's right there at the, the base of the Ski Apache. Well, actually, it's further from Ski Apache, oh. but yes, it's a ways away. Chris grew up in Rodosa, so she could give you a detailed explanation <laughs> of the geography. Yeah. I tend to associate with Ski Apache because that's when I see it is when I go towards Ski Apache. But fair enough, it's not exactly at the base of Ski Apache. But um, these are, these are um, this is a sculpture done by a, an Apache artist uh, showing the, the mass dancers, the, the, the mountain gods uh, that are important to the, uh, to the Apache. So then in this particular case, we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at uh, Kachina, talking about Kachina as part of this larger cross-cultural pattern that we see. So why talk about Kachina? Well, a couple of reasons. One, the Kachina are one of the best known sorts of these mass dancing traditions, in part because we have Puebloan scholars who have provided detailed culturally appropriate knowledge. And so these are folks who are very familiar with uh, the, the Kachina. Um, sometimes they are themselves Kachina. They participate in the, the Kachina uh, ceremonies. They can give us insiders' views of the Kachina. They can give us the culturally appropriate views of the Kachina. So that you know, we we have the information that is culturally appropriate, and that we can talk about, we can think about, and use to understand the sort of broader pattern that we're seeing. And also, we can appreciate those Kachina figures that are for sale everywhere, and that we all have one or two in our collections, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And not every pueblo, but many pueblos will invite uh, folks who are not part of the pueblo to Kachina dances, and so they'll they'll invite people to the dances. If you go, if you are in New Mexico, like a in, corn dance or something. A corn like dance. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in going, you can go to the uh, Pueblo Indian Heritage uh, Center. And they can actually give you a list of the, the dances that are open um, and give you uh, etiquette that, that would be expected as a, as a visitor for those. And so if somebody is actually interested in going and seeing one of these dances, uh, there's a, you have to be careful. Oh, okay, Crystal, Crystal will return back to this. Um, and I know that you all are actually working with uh, the Pauake tribe to perhaps um, have somebody come and, and talk about uh, uh, this from their particular perspective. Yeah. One thing about and the... we've attended their uh, dances and other pueblos, and it's fascinating. It's well, from glorious. the beginning yeah. of our institute, uh, the partnership between the founder, Dr. Goodman, and the governor of the pueblo, uh, Powaki, oh. have worked hand in hand together, and so that's always been a relationship of cooperation. 
wonderful. That that is wonderful. One of the things to, to keep in mind, and I know that Chris will talk about this, but when we're we're talking about uh, the Kachina, it's not as if it's actually a single religious system. Instead, each different group in the, the Southwest, each Pueblo group, uh, has their own uh, structure to the Kachina religion. They have different Kachina, what the Kachina mean, and how they're they're integrated into. Uh, the 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 larger system varies from group to group, and so we're not talking about a single sort of a unified thing here, like we might be talking about when we're talking about, say, Hinduism or something like that, where there's a there's larger people. level of of cohesiveness. Um, here, each group has their own tradition that this is is reflecting. It's also significant in terms of uh, southwestern uh, artistic traditions, and so if you've been in the Southwest, if you've gone to Zuni or Hopi, if you've gone to the uh, Old Town in um, Albuquerque or any of the, these various places where uh, lots of uh, Puebloan artists sell their, their art, you've probably seen some of the Kachina um, dolls that are available uh, for sale there. They're, they're beautiful and show incredible levels of craftsmanship. When my father retired from the Navy, he uh, went and worked on the Zuni and the Navajo reservations. Uh, he has some of my earliest memories are the, the Kachina dolls that he was given or they bought from some of the folks he was working with. And I it kind of pleases me that some of my uh, children's first memories are also the same Kachina dolls that uh, that my father had been given or had, had purchased from the folks he works with. This is one of my favorite uh, artists. This is a Hopi painter, Raymond Naha. And he frequently worked in Kachina themes, Kachina imagery in his uh, artistic traditions. It's it's incredible. If you've been to the uh, New Mexico State Fair or any of those other places where they show uh, or have displays of, uh, of uh, Pueblo and artists, you'll, you've probably seen some Kachina related uh, imagery. It's, it's very cool. So the Kachina are very nice because we have culturally appropriate knowledge that folks who are part of the system have provided, with, uh, provided us. And so we're, we, we've got some good information on it. But it's also something that is readily recognizable and people are, are familiar with. Um, this is a, a living tradition that people continue to apply, they continue to grow, uh, they continue to use. Can I go on? Please go ahead. This um, is called a doll. They are not to be played with in the way you're thinking about a doll here, but this is at the Museum of Anthropology here at Mizzou. Um, they have a wonderful collection of kachinas, and that's a whole nother lecture. So as part of the museum, trying to understand um, their kachinas, they asked me to give an evening lecture about four years ago. So I'm just using what I presented um, for the public, public to understand these things and what kachinas are based on what we know. My main sources, Todd and my main sources for this was we were really fortunate in undergrad at Eastern New Mexico University to have a Native American professor who was a medicine man by the name of Bill Hawk, um, William Hawk. Bill Hawk, um, he was, what, in his 60s when he's teaching in the uh, late 1980s. So he was an older gentleman, but he would do different um, sunrise activities on the quad. When they asked for a medicine man to come out and say prayers, he'd be out there doing it. One of his sisters married into Hamas. So in the late 1980s, he said in one of the classes, anybody want to go to a Hamas corn dance? And you'll have to drive yourself up, but you can come up if you want to. So I think about six of us said, we'll, we'll go. And so that was um, really wonderful to be with his in-laws and seeing a, an open corn dance. But Bill Hawk, as being um, UP Algonquin, having a sister married into the system, he, he talked quite a bit about Pueblo and people. Bill Hawk also, we always just called him Bill, our Hawk, said the Handbook of North American Indians published by the Smithsonian, he said, would be the authority from here on out through time. And in 2022, I think um, Hawk is still correct. The volumes on the Southwest were edited by Alfonso Ortiz. So Anything that was written by Anglo scholars, Hispanic scholars, or other Native American scholars was vetted through Alfonso Ortiz. Um, wonderful gentleman, taught at the University of New Mexico. I was scheduled to take a class with him, and unfortunately, he passed away um, 
right before I was going to take a class. I was really looking forward to having a class from um, Dr. Ortiz. Um, anyway, so this was volumes nine and 10. And so a lot of the discussion that we'll be talking about with Kachinas come from the handbook of North American Indians from Alfonso Ortiz, but also the various chapters in there. But one of the important ones we'll be um, looking at today is Edmund Ladd. Edmund Ladd, Edmund Ladd, Ed Ladd, was Zuni, a Kachina, and he would tell archaeologists and anthropologists that were asking questions, he goes, if it's the right time of year, and if I can, I will answer it. And when we talk mm. about landscape and cosmology, there are times that certain activities happen in the year. And one of the things is when you can tell certain stories uh, at certain times of the year, often it's winter time. A lot of times different things happen in the summer. Anyway, so Ed was always careful about that. He also wrote other um, chapters and books. He had a master's in anthropology and he talked well with anthropologists. And of course, every anthropologist seemed to be asking questions to Ed, but he would publish. This was published right after he passed away. The original hardback is 1994. But anyway, so we're leaning into Ed Ladd. And then there's one other person that I mentioned earlier with serpents, and that's Michael Cabote. In 2008 and 2009, I launched a project with some of my friends, uh, Christopher Carr, Elizabeth Newsom. We were looking at things that we might call in common sensical animism and spirit beliefs. And uh, Michael Capote was our discussant on two different conferences. And so I sat and had many wonderful dinners. I went to his hotel room. I bought jewelry, of course, because he's a wonderful silversmith. Um, wonderful person, absolute um, person. Unfortunately, he he passed away at the, I think, the end of 2009. But he openly talked about things and was very generous with his knowledge. And again, I mentioned him earlier. He got down to Teotihuacan in the Pyramid of the Serpent and he goes, this is my clan serpent. I recognize that. And that's a story that he told many people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just me, it's out there. But anyway, and these are my primary sources for this uh, discussion. Todd mentioned this earlier. So when I'm in classes teaching about um, Native American courses, I often say for the Southwest, go to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. Um, the webpage is fabulous. You can also go and see dances there. And I follow them on Facebook. They're usually having different dancers come out. So they may have somebody from Cochiti, maybe Zuni, maybe Navajo, maybe Apache. So it's a way that you can see things and talk to individuals. And uh, they're all about um, education and also the correct behaviors if you're going out to the different pueblos when you can and cannot go, what things are open or not open. So it's a really good resource for any of us. And I consider myself a student too. So as a student, I like to check in as well. Many of you probably already know this. These are the main um, Northern Rio Grande and not so Northern Rio Grande um, Pueblos, um, Pewaukee, of course, with CI headquarters sitting right off there, I think. Um, you guys know better than me. But then we also have a number of other, these are called the Western Pueblos, and this would be Hopi and Zuni. And then, of course, Acoma and Laguna are kind of in the middle, and they all speak different languages, have different Kachina religious beliefs a little bit, and different Kachinas. And Todd talked about that. Hopi present day. Um, count is over 400 Kachinas have been recorded at Hopi, only a couple at Taos. So there seems to be, um, according to the writers in Alfonso's or T. Handbook of North American Indians, there tends to be a difference between the Western Pueblos and the Eastern Pueblos. So there's a bit of differences um, happening in the different Pueblos. This is Acoma Sky City. Um, wonderful place. You can go up there and tour it and they will talk about it. And one of the things I, I did when Basil was little, so this was 2003, a friend of mine went up and toured Acoma. The church is absolutely fabulous. It is really worth going and you'll probably have a, a tour guide. The tour guide we had was talking about the Kachinas painted on the church walls. And you say, wait a minute, Kachinas painted on a church wall, a Catholic church wall? Yes. And then he talked about how 
male and female rituals happen, the importance of that. So I invite you, um, I, I don't invite you rather, they invite at the public time people to tour Acoma. And I, I bought some pottery up there. Um, this is a parrot. Parrots are important for um, people in the Southwest. They probably come through the South. The site we've been working at as archeologists is down South of the border in the Casas Grandes world. We have a lot of macaws down there. Zuni and Hopi both say that the parrot clans come from the South. Hopi has said that Pakime, one of the sites we've been hubbing around is um, found, their clans come out of Pakime. So there's been a lot of movement on the landscape. But anyway, this I just bought this because of the parrot. But again, um, they open this up for tourists to look at those kachinas in the church. The Hopi, at least Spanish, found them very peaceful. Um, they also say that they're in a state, what the Hopi um, scholars say, they're in the process of becoming Hopi and that they work really hard on being a peaceful people. Um, this will not surprise people from New Mexico, but here in Missouri with our youth, I, said, I say we have places that do not have electricity. Some of the Hopi Mesas do not have electricity. Acoma, Sky City has remained without electricity by choice as part of their heritage. And so this is just a look at the environment. This is second Mesa. There's some power lines, but also outhouses. So a different way of living than in the core of America than we're used to living. But Hopi, as the peaceful people, they're also known as the blue corn people. They are very dependent on the natural elements. That's our words, natural element. But a Hopi farmer, when he plants corn, he does a lot of prayers. He or she does a lot of prayers, both males and females plant. And again, if you're dependent on natural falling rain, um, I, I suspect the prayers become very important. They do not have um, agriculture. So again, whatever comes from the sky, what we might call those serpent clouds moving that we saw at Cuyamanga headquarters, that's something they really want to bless their land to make sure their crops propagate. They, the Hopi like, all Native Americans are incredibly talented. Um, their carvers for their kachinas are just splendid, but they have the blue corn maiden kachina and um, it plays into their, their um, iconography, into their art tradition. But um, yeah, that's what she does. She brings and maintains the, the blue corn. She also has something called butterfly whirls. The Hopi when women are um, becoming uh, from girl to woman, anthropologists call it puberty, right? They will wrap their hair in butterfly whorls as that. And she's a very special woman, a very powerful woman. Um, a lot of ceremonies happen when they put in the butterfly whorls. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of stuff by scholars that also talk about that. Interesting. So this is actually out of Zuni. Um, Zuni has had a lot to say about anthropologists. They have had, can I be this uh, forthright? Mm -hmm. We've had some really, as anthropology was starting as a brand new field, it didn't come into existence as a discipline until um, 1878. That's when anthropology first expedition of anthropology starts, 1878. They go to Zuni, New Mexico. We have people that are not trained. We have people that don't have a degree in anthropology. We have a army colonel who wives go and she had no training and she by all accounts was a miserable human being. And some bad things happened with anthropology because she thought um, that Native Americans wouldn't survive and she had to take stuff back to the Smithsonian. So it's a really sad chapter in anthropology's history. But we also had other people later, um, Ruth uh, Bunzel who ended up being adopted in Zuni um, had a family relationship and she was a bit more respectable. So anthropology has this weird relationship with Zuni. And even today, a lot of anthropologists still try to go into Zuni and work. It's been the first place of um, anthropology as a discipline. But here's a black and white picture out of that original Smithsonian Institution in 19, or rather, I'm sorry, 1879. Today, 
the the Zuni people, the Ashui, are going um, strong. They have a proud tradition. This was posted on their webpage for public consumption. Dalalani is their corn mesa, and so that plays very prominent into their um, stories. Todd and I actually did archaeological res research in the early 1990s with UNM. So we were out there doing field work on the backside of Del Alany and, and through here doing Governor Door archeology. span A beautiful place. Um, when is the right time and when they're, when they're happy, they'll talk. Um, our experience where uh, the food was excellent and they loved trying to get us to buy their jewelry. And we were very poor, but we bought a few nice pieces of pottery and, and jewelry out there. And they were always really happy to to talk to us. We wouldn't even have to ask a question. It was really inviting. So that's another story. <laughs> the Zuni are adapted. We already talked about the relationship of serpents and corn and corn and life and corn. Zuni has a particular thing called waffle gardens, really important. And these are the historic waffle gardens out of Zuni. Zuni today are teaching their use to do waffle gardens. And places in Albuquerque are looking at that and some of the school systems are adopting that because um, it works so well with the limited amount of, of resources. So even the educators in Albuquerque are beginning to realize if we're really gonna conserve on water mm -hmm. and we're gonna take care of our aquifers, we've got to start doing a better job as people in Albuquerque and doing that. So a lot of people, even in the South, um, the ranchers, we work down South, just six miles North of the United States border. The ranchers do waffle gardens, but they make these round ones. And she's doing that to conserve water because the wells are getting so deep and it's really an environmental issue with the aquifers. So being logical. Hot. You build a berm around where you want the water to stay according to the size of the root ball beneath, right? Make, right, make absolutely. Sense. Yeah. Yes. So waffle gardens, really important way of dealing with this precious limited water resource. When Todd and I were in grad school at UNM, the proje projection would be Albuquerque's aquifers would be drained by 2030. I don't know if people have looked at that lately, but that's kind of a daunting thought to imagine yeah. these cities without water. You can't survive without water um, anyway. So some of the active things going on in Albuquerque are looking at what uh, other cultures are doing and how they lived in this environment with limited resources. So it's really a pretty good idea to figure out how to conserve water. Mm -hmm. Corn and people, um, we just last Saturday, we were in Gallup, New Mexico doing the Gallup flea market. We really enjoyed it, um, mostly Navajo, but you can occasionally run into people from Zuni out there. Um, anyway, some of the, the their arts, the oops, I went too far. Art shows the relationship of the corn maiden. Um, people in corn, there's this rich metaphor with corn and people, we see that in Mesoamerica from the get-go early thousands of years ago into present day um, North America, especially with the Iroquois I have corn maidens, the three sisters, the holy sisters, corn bean and squash, they are sisters, they work together, they work in harmony. We're seeing that throughout Meso. Beans were also domesticated in Meso and in South America. Interestingly enough, some of the earliest squash are Meso, but also here in Missouri, some of the earliest squash, and they come together in this wonderful package. Anyway, sorry, I digress, but uh, corn maize. Because they help each other grow when you plant them together, right? Yeah, exactly. For the Iroquois, that's the way the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee do that, Ab absolutely. The Hopi don't, they put them individually in rows of corn today, but yes, um, some of the tribes do plant them together. Mm. This is Ed Ladd, who is Zuni himself. This is out of the handbook of North American Indians. I know that because of the year. But the Kachina system, if you will, are the Zuni social, this is his word, social religious organization is composed of interlocking subsystem, each operating independently, but superimposed on each other. There are 13 matrilineal clans matrilineal in case you're not an anthropologist or know this word it means the descent through the mother's line so it used to be you know 40 50 years ago in the united states we were patrilin patrilineal meaning we had our father's name this is different in this part of the world um you trace your ancestry through your mother so as william hawk um used to talk about in his class of bill hawk 
you always know who your mother is. He was he was really a fun fun professor to learn from. But yeah, so they're matrilineal clans from the mother's clans. And there's also two uh, priesthood and they're called the bow and the rain. And there are six Kiva groups which comprise six Kachina societies. And they integrate and put together a social organization of males working across the um, society, working really well, the Kachina societies. You want to add anything to that, Todd? No, it, it just emphasizes the relationships within the community. Uh, no part of the community can exist and be uh, effective without the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. hmm. Each of the six Kiva societies are associated with, a, this is again, Ed Ladd, a uh, direction, an animal, and a color. Most Kachina dances in Zuni are performed by these societies. They also conduct dances on the plaza. Um, they used to be underground, but with the Spanish coming in with all the, the things that happened, they started hiding their kivas and they put them in room blocks to make it just look like another room so they couldn't uh. be found. So they're now above ground, but you still at Zuni would have to climb in and then climb down into into the uh the kiva and again that that's a ritual space that you know we can't go into nor should we go into so yeah anyway every male this is ed lad's words again zuni man zuni um kachina anthropologist every male belongs to one of these six kiva groups each kiva director is a member of the deer clan his deputy is a member of the badger clan and there are at least two bow priests Ideally, each Kiva society has males from each clan. Oh, interesting. So what do you think that does for society? If you have these Kiva societies and it has a member of males from each clan, what do you think happens? Or why would that be important? Or a lot of good cooperation. Society? Yeah. Exactly. A lot of great cooperation. Anthropologists have found that a lot of Native Americans have sodality, are places where men gather from different clans you are less likely to fight and feud with your brother i mean yeah brothers feud, no doubt about it but you'll be more cooperative and you'll have this incredible cooperative network that makes them by anthropologists looking from the outside in look very peaceful because you don't have as much fracturing because men are working together in these societies maybe it's time for congress and uh, yeah. all get together, Republican, Democrat, and, and, go, <laughs> and go do a dance together, because I think they could learn exactly. something Exactly. <laughs> you have to have two yeah. Republicans, two Democrats, two Green Party. I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but that that's how this society, uh, according to Ed Ladd, again, um, is organized to, to work. Um, this is just art. When I was growing up, for both the Apache, but also Pueblo and groups. And even as an adult, you cannot take your cameras out there. You cannot photograph. Um, it used to be you'd be escorted off the plaza and they destroy your filming camera. So I try to never do photographs or pictures out of respect, but um, there's enough of these um, murals and paintings in the public um, world and on the Google now that I, I tend to use their paintings, Native American paintings that have either sold them or shared them or do museum exhibits. But yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful way of cooperation and working well together. Um, now, uh, in a lot of the Puebloan, and I tend to lean more into Zuni because Ed Ladd talked about the Zuni, so that's just where I'm at because of the, the public presentations. But the cumulus um, clouds, these step clouds, I like this one, looks like a feather. This is actually outside of my father's home in southern New Mexico. I shot this one day many years ago. I was like, wow, that looks like something that Ed Lab would call a, a casina or a cachina or a coco. Um, the, uh, Ed Lab tells us that the Zuni word is coco, uh, something that mimics it for Hobie's casina. Anyway, these are, they're all the same thing. They're these, these cloud beans, the breath, the ancestors, which are really important for dropping the rain. And it is dropping the rain, isn't it? That is, it's a really nice, gentle rain. It's what everyone, I don't care who you are. I mean, growing up in New Mexico, everyone prays for rain. 
Yeah. Even people are not terribly religious. When it gets dry enough, we're all playing for rain. And it used to be growing up in New Mexico. When rain comes, you just stop and you watch the rain. Um, yeah, it's a blessing for everyone. The um, what, what they call, according to Ed Ladd and also um, Caboti and others, uh, casinas, cachinas, um, coco can be clouds, rain, snow, mist, breath often travel as clouds and they are the masked dancers who die. Some of the Zuni artists, uh, this is a famous one, Duane, he's showing that that concept of the clouds in, in the Kachina. They tend to be benevolent beings. They embody spirit of living things, the spirit of ancestors. They possess power over nature, especially weather and rain making is the common way that we've thought about, that we've been told about it. The casinas come from places where the water emerges, so where the clouds are coming up. And it makes sense. If you ever watch um, anywhere in New Mexico, the way the, the the mountains seem to build the clouds, and that's where the water is emerging. Uh, the San Francisco mountains are Hopi's casino home. Zuni Coco have several homes. Most important is the Lake of the Whispering Water. Um, these are important places. And most of the tribes have fought hard to get their mountains back. Um, early anthropologists, especially Taos and other where were on the legal rights to help um, the different Pueblos get the right to the water. That's something that we were enlisted early on in the 1950s were, were to help with um, the water rights. Uh, they're really important. I'm frozen again. Ed Ladd in a book on Kachinas, he says, uh, Coco means the mass, the dancer, and the spirit beings. These are his words, not mine. Spirits of the underworld and the afterworld is a perfect reflection of this world in our belief, according to Lab, that he's sharing with us. Mm -hmm. So important to be in right relationship with all this. Yes, and the Kachinas also have um, familial relationships. They're a family. And so you have chiefs and you have sons and you have the family network working together ah. with the Kachinas as families. And they do a lot of dancing and singing. That's one of the roles. They do enjoy the rituals and the singing and the dance and the prayers, and they work together. And again, together is a big key for what Ed Ladd's telling us for Zuni. Coco again means the mass. And I'm just uh, outlining the different aspects of the Coco from Ed Ladd. And the spirit being spirits of the afterworld, again, is the perfect. So even the mask are reflections. So they're synonymous. You have the being and the mask, one and the same thing. And so when a person, a Zuni, puts on that mask, he is Coco. There is not a man in a, in a, in a, a mask. No, no. He, that man becomes the embodiment of, of the Coco. And he is the Coco when he dies. He goes to the world of the Coco. Um, as Zuni, there are two types of masks. There are individual masks that are presented to a, a young man who's gone to an initiation. And then there are the priestly or the chief Kachina masks that belong to, to the clan or the Kiva society. We talked about the feather serpent. Yeah. In, and I can never say this right. Zuni people have helped me a hundred times and I have a really hard time with Zuni vowels. But this is their horn, plume, serpent, a conch shell, the big, huge conch trumpets. When they are blown, they're the voice of who we see. That's my best. Please forgive me. Um, he calls out the the Kachinas to come back to the village to do the dances, to do the um, singing and, and dancing. So he's a, if you will, a creator God. Um, that's not a really good translation, but he's the one that calls in the Kachinas to do the dance. Interesting. The Kachinas, they come in as Zuni and Hopi. This was on the Hopi tribal webpage that I took a couple of years ago, more like five years ago. As Zuni and Hopi, there are different times of the year when the Kachinas are present, when they dance and sing and do rituals and they have a, a calendar. So out here at Hopi is Kasina season. It's a little more than half the year. 
And then there's the non-casino season. They go back to the San Francisco peaks for the Hopi and they, they live there. And then during the casino and um, Tony will like this, what we call in the December solstice, they're calling the winter solstice. They come in and that's when they're, they're called back to the, to the bubblos. There are multiple bubblos out at Hopi and then they start the casino society. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and there are different types of casinos. This one I'm borrowing more onto Hopi. Um, there are the beautiful casinos. There are casino girls, um, different type of casinos, rainmakers. Um, this one is actually Dwayne Dushi. He's Zuni, so this is actually this is, is Zuni. Here he did a, a big book years ago, and I had to borrow it from our archives out at Mizzou. They actually had it. Um, downy feathers, those soft rains of feathers. When I thought about us at CI headquarters and we saw the feathery serpents, it almost looked like these soft downy feathers off the mast. This is the portrait of, of the rain. Again, Duane's work. Um, Jim Fred, one of my favorites showing in the Pueblo, the, the ceremony with watermelons and the fertility of all the wonderful things that we see in, in the Southwest. There is also hunting dances out at Hopi. There are all kinds of rituals, all kinds. And again, Hopi has now reported over 400 casinos. And at, going back to Zuni a little bit more to the East, uh, Zuni spirit world is full of many kinds of kachinas. We have the animals that are found in the natural environment, the mountain sheep casino, I don't know, a kachina in this part of the world, a coco to use Ed Ladd's word, coco. Um, they'll do dances to help the game animals help with the things that are going on with, with that. They dance with um, rainmakers and bells and rattles when they're on the plazas mm. and that you can see when they're open to the public. Yeah, that's why I say over 400 casinos out at Hopi. They also create dolls for learning. Early on when it, um, Early people were look, I mean, early Euro Americans were out there. They noticed the girls had these, these dolls and some very unscrupulous traders said, hey, little girl, I'll give you a piece of candy for that. And then they go sell it. That's a no, no. It was a big battle for Zuni and Hopi. Historically, they really didn't want to sell them or do that. And then the tribes finally said, yes, we'll sell them, but we'll change some of the stuff on them. They'll be not made in the traditional way. Exactly, and, and we can sell them. But some of the earliest uh, kachinas, the dolls and the museums may be unscrupulously gotten. And I know that um, both uh, Zuni and Hopi have been trying to get some of them back. Um, I, I wish them good luck. I hope they get the ones they want back. But anyway, now they, they, they sell them. But Edlad has this wonderful discussion in one of his writings where he talks about the man, the godfather, carves the doll out of Zuni. And on the day when there's a big dance, he's in his, uh, he is Coco, he's in his finery. And it's a big day when he presents the doll to his goddaughter. Uh -huh. And um, he tells her, it is really a Coco. This is real, it's your baby. Take care of it, take care of it like you would a child. This is your mm -hmm. responsibility. And those are Ed Loud's words being Zuni. And he, he talks about that. So it's a really wonderful little um, discussion he has, but that's what they were historically. Now they're for, for trading and making money. And some of the Zuni and Hopi, that's how they make their livelihood and that, that, that feeds their families and themselves. So one of the interesting things that's happened in the last 20 years is a lot, Hopi and Zuni, I can't not speak for, uh, the Eastern Pueblos, but both Zuni and Hopi have gone to, when it's adult, when it's the wooden carved thing, it's Kachina. When it is a spirit being or the mass, it's the other word, Kachina or Coco. So they started mm. differentiating it to keep it straight. So mm. the mass and the beans are those words, but the dolls Kachina. That's how they've changed the language that has been shifting over the last two decades in Hopi and Zuni. Makes sense. So again, Coco, and here I love this at it, this painting, um, Duane again, out at, this is uh, uh, Mesa Verde showing the 
the kachina coming, the, I'm sorry, I misspoke, the cocoa, there was uh, cocoa coming out. But again, this um, shift in language, the kachina being the wooden carved thing that can be sold. What else do you want to add to that, Todd? Nothing. This is one of my favorite paintings. Um, Fred Cabote was put in um, school, drove away from, you know, Hopi, ended up in Santa Fe as part of the United States government policy. Anyway, don't get me started on uh, government policies to educate and take out Native beliefs out of children. So they started hauling them away to different boarding schools. But the Santa Fe school was one of the more open and one of the directors started encouraging the children to paint things they knew and to make them a little more comfortable and we get this great tradition fred cabote is one of those who painted things from home and elsewhere i just love the shows the the uh kachina the cocos whatever word they're using um casino would be hopi um uh dancing on the the, the plaza. This is Fred Cabote. That is Michael Cabote's father. And so again, I was leaning into Michael Cabote. I had um, worked with him. We were going to work on a, on a book chapter for one of my books, but he unfortunately passed away. But I never got to meet his father, Fred. But Michael Cabote is a wonderful human. I'm sad he's gone. But anyway, last minute thoughts. Kachinas, Kachinas, Coco. Yes. <laughs> Questions. I know there are probably a few questions. Well, first of all, just thank you for putting it in perspective because it's such a a, a sophisticated and complex system system of understanding that goes way beyond what Westerners are, have a grasp of. We just looking at it from the outside, trying to understand. And you've given us such a nice way of being able to re respectively build a bridge of understanding. The other thing is, is I made that that comment earlier, which was more meant to be humorous. But the reality is, is that you know, the Iroquois uh, Native American um, governor, government system was sort of adopted as part of building our own U.S. Constitution. Right. And, that, and, and, and with that in mind, maybe it's time for us to go back <laughs> and, yeah, and get, learn. Well. Some, it's time for the next lesson number two because lesson number one got us started. We need to learn more. And uh, it's, yeah, this is a, yeah. a great time uh, for us to, to, to address that. Ed Ladd. As a Zuni, as a Coco once wrote in the Southwest, the loneliest, saddest thing you'll ever see is a lone cloud. That was a man who didn't work well with others. Mm. And I thought, you know, that summarizes so eloquently what he knew about his beliefs. But yeah, so mm -hmm. a lone cloud is a sad and lonely thing to see in mm. the American Southwest. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Anyway, this is west of Albuquerque. Um, it's not a lone cloud. These are clouds that build up and work together. <laughs> well, and, and this really gives credence for me for modern day scientific exploration, whether we're talking about uh, anthropology and understanding the human systems and seeing what we can learn from cultures across the planet, but also um, the astronomy. I mean, looking to the sky, the, the work that, that Tony's involved in as a scientist, but at the same time, you're bringing it down to the level of the heart when you start getting into that direct connectedness. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, Tony and I have, a, uh, and a couple of us get the every morning send, send pictures of sunrises because <laughs> we've got this new element of like, this is the way to greet the day every Fred single day. Fred and Bianca. Day. Yeah, and, yeah, ongoing yeah Fred and Bianca. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's so, wonderful. Yeah. So. It's a powerful. Um, speaking if you're going to believe that the all of life is sacred, all of the universe is sacred, then you have a personal relationship right there. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to be honored, um, right? all the elements of nature. Yeah. yeah. Well, building on that a little bit, Laura, one of the focuses, one of the things that keeps on being repeated when Native uh, uh, folks are talking about their particular tradition, whatever tradition that is, is the, the nature of the balance that's created. There's a balance within the community created by the the various Kiva societies, the Kachina societies. There's also a balance between the Kachina and the humans. The Kachina and the humans are partners as opposed to the humans somehow being um, uh, being servants of the Kachina. They're instead working together cooperatively as opposed to some sort of a subservient sort of a, a relationship. And so it does stress that the balance that you're talking about there, balance within the community, balance between the the community and the Kachina balance uh, between the community and the, the larger world around them. A um, reciprocal absolutely. relationship with nature. We don't have dominion over nature. 
right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're mm-hmm. in that cooperative role. That right. really changes our worldview and what we're doing, mm. doesn't it? And some Native American writers and Mesoamerican writers, um, there's a, a, I'm sorry, brain fart. David Carrasco, who is at Harvard in the Divinity School and Anthropology, traces his heritage to the Aztecs. Um, he's, he's, he has written extensively about how humans role is they're actually serving but they have to pray they have to work they have to work in harmony to make the cycle work the ceremonial cycle they have a role so, here to play yeah it's the role it's the role mm-hmm. of humor and that's david carrasco's work and he's written a lot i can't put all of his books on one um shelf um he's written extensively on that oh. and but that demands that we have this interactive role it demands that we show up it demands respect it demands effort it demands okay. attention mm-hmm. it, it demands the flow of energy yeah. and sacrifice yeah. to give of yourself and to give up precious yeah. things of yourself for that that role yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah. And maybe in strengthening our relationship with the world around us, which sounds like such common sense, and yet we've lost common sense. I mean, we, don't, we have to be told and maybe we have to look to some other culture and say, oh, you should, you should honor nature. You should have some kind of relationship. You should recognize <laughs> the fact that the sun is up and the sun is down. Maybe you should. It's more fun to have that personal relationship. <laughs> it's beyond fun. It's, it's it life itself. It makes the yeah. universe feel comforting. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it feel like somebody's at home and <laughs> watching out. Exactly. Over us, that there's a purpose to it, right? It right. puts it in a whole different context. Uh, I'm going to take we some... We miss that. We Westerners miss that. Sorry. We need to restore that. Yeah. I'm going to take some comments and questions now. Uh, I know Fred, you had you you had put a couple of questions in the chat room, but first why don't of all, you go... I want to thank Christine. And oh Dawn. yeah, I want to thank you both for this beautiful presentation, you all thank that you, you bring to your classes, and thank you for sharing it with us yes. yeah. um, as well in our community. outside of the university to the universe. Yeah, oh, good one. <laughs> well said. We're listening. The universe is our university. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah. they call it, university. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Fred. Who's up first? I'm going to yeah. put Fred up because Fred uh, was asking a couple of questions in the chat room as we went along. Hi. Uh, let me just go through my questions and then um, and see if they haven't been covered. Um, I'm a parrot. <laughs> uh, yes. He's, he has always said that, I mean, we're a bonded pair. He's a he's always said, Yes. He's always he's said that if we, ever have, if we ever have a wedding ceremony, he wants an Akama parrot wedding uh, vase. <laughs> I think that's appropriate. I think that that he knows what he wants. Yes, yes. <laughs> he knows what he wants. And believe but me, he has a voice. Is, <laughs> at at, uh, at places like like Akama or elsewhere, where they have the communities broken into these named clans that that intermarry in certain in certain arcane ways, um, are they? In their dances, do they wear the masks of their clans, or is there another system for why they wear what masks they do wear? That's a great question. And from reading in Ortiz's edited volume and also some of Ed Ladd's stuff for I Zuni is what I'm more comfortable answering that with because what what's written by native people. Um the answer is the chief may wear the uh clan mask but the individual males wear their individual mask and it's kind of a hierarchical learning so your early initiate initiates as young men that are um young men but as you get to more senior to the high level you can um wear and have more masks so it also changes with age and responsibility but if you're the deer clan you can wear the deer clan head mask um, other anthropologists have talked about in the matrilineal matrilocal local society, when the men are not using them or, um, having them, the mask is still alive and they have to be fed cornmeal. And it would be that, uh, female, let's say deer clan, the, the clan mask, she is responsible for feeding that mask and keeping it alive. Mm. The, the cocoa at Zuni. Yeah, so yes and no. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, it seems like there's there's various systems for it in different right. 
in different communities, right? Absolutely. And an individual mask, what's the, I mean, what's the broad range of an individual mask, let's say within a place like Laguna, where I've seen the masks many times there, but I mean, how, how, do you know how these things work within? I have to go into what anthropologists have, have teased out in some of the anthropological um, discussion. So Luis Lamphier has got a chapter in the handbook of North American Indians. And I believe she talks about how, you know, pull down, I'm going to answer a little different. I changed my thinking. Just hold on, pull down some of your dad's kachinas, the one dancing. Hold on, Fred. I love yeah. visuals. Um, these were given to Todd's um, father by oh. a gift. You got some beautiful, yeah. No, no, the actual rain dancers. No, no, the ones down, the museum quality ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me two of those. Yeah, here's this one. We need some rain dancers in Arizona. Oh, that's a cool one. Yeah, and we've got a whole one. No, one of the identical ones, too. Are those all from, from Zuni? Um, yes, these are, I believe, from Zuni. Yes. But you would have the individual mass. So during the initiation, the males would be given a mass made by his godfathers and others in the Cuba Society at Zuni. And so you would have the individual mass that the young man would wear. And let me see. Then you would have another Kachina, the, the chief of the of the Kiva Society would might wear the, the clan mask and be out in front. And then you would have uh the what we call mud heads or the clowns. Those masks um, would also be worn and they would be dancing around these um, dancers and fixing anything that's loose and running. You can see that if you go mostly to any of the open ceremonies. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, so the individual masks are, they can be identical, but they're individual. So he knows this is his cocoa and this guy knows this is his cocoa. So we actually see the 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 chief of the Kachina and some of the other, depending on which group we're, we're looking at, which of the the various nations we're looking at, sometimes we can see very long-lived traditions for particular Kachina masks. And so we can recognize from rock art from the 1700s to 1600s, a particular Kachina and say, that is wow. that is this particular one. And it has not changed. Now, presumably the mask has been repaired or may even be a new mask. Uh, we simply don't know. And, and that's not something that uh, people have talked about. But the, the point here is that there are certain certain masks that have high levels of consistency. Mm -hmm. Then there are others where, um, when we were uh, working with uh, some of our Zuni colleagues while we were working at Zuni, they actually talked about the retirement of a particular Kachina that was an individual who wore a particular um, a, a particular Kachina, a particular mask. And that was, that was his and not somebody else's. Well, let me just add one thing. Ed Ladd in his 2000 piece talks about how masks are never buried with an individual that if a mask is being retired is taken away from the pueblo there because the spirits can come in and and out of them that they're really dangerous so they are buried away from zuni proper in in the in the desert because they're they're so powerful but he talks about that in several of his publications so we know what, what, is, what is his main book ed lad he doesn't have a main book. He was invited to do chapters in a lot of different edited volumes. Mm, his right. actual that's, master's that's thesis the is on feathers. I'm sorry? That's the same name as a certain Hickory Apache guy of around 1900. I remember my brother had some pictures of Ed Ladd with some white guys around, taken around 1910, I think it was. Wow. But that's exactly the same person. No, it's not. There's an Edmund Hickory. Ladd who was Zuni and then I don't know this other Ed Lab. That's interesting. Yeah, look it up. I mean, I bet you'll agree. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that there was, so Ed Lad's father was Hickoria and he was an earnest lad. I wonder if, if wonder that if could be the connection. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. I, I, I don't know. I, I simply don't know. Yeah, yeah that's why um, I was confused. I thought Ed Lad, wasn't he? A, yeah. I, I, so if you find a Kachina, represented in rock art it must be there purposefully in that place to do what why would it be in that place on that, that particular rock cliff story. and featured there have you looked at the associations yeah and there's a huge debate 
about that in American archaeology. And I have a rock art friend who was in the room earlier. I don't know if she is still here. She might be able to answer some of this as well. Margulith, if you're here, maybe you can weigh in still. But um, yeah, what are the, what are uh, the people we have, and it is so sacred that um, Women are not allowed to go to a section of Zuni or they prefer them not to, but there are some masks on a wall that's put there for a very particular reason. A lot of times archeologists say, well, we see a face carved out on rock art. It must be a Kachina, but it's probably more complex than that. So we're weighing on that. But historically, what we consider the Kachina religion, it develops in the mid 1300s something happens in the southwest and we start getting in pottery and on rock art throughout uh the northern rio grande up the kachinas um some people say they start in pocky may and i have people now writing that christine vanpool says the kachinas start at pocky may i just want to say no it does not i don't see a lot of evidence for kachinas out at pocky may i don't think they come through casas but that's my um perspective based on iconography but there are people that say they came somewhere from uh northern mexico i think they're actually coming from arizona in the salado and that's his his talk but wow. yeah it but for sure it starts appearing in the thir mid 1300s going up in rock art and actually i think on my powerpoint for my students i have a couple that you want to see another slide real quick you want me to try yeah. on my Slide real quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, Fred off the screen here. No, Fred. maybe for some time. Yeah, you got no, more questions. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't feel like I did a good job answering your question. Those are some of those you would have to talk to somebody at Laguna that no, knows. No, really great, yeah. great, excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can we see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the tablitas, this is called a tablita coming up. This has been considered. Is Margulith still in the room? I'm not that I see. Okay, this is uh, considered to be a Kachina. Some people say when you have a face uh, looking up, this is three rivers in uh, southern New Mexico, not too far off of Highway 54. My dad just lives a little north. I grew up in these mountains. This is Ski Apache up here, by the way. That's Ski Apache. And the Mount Sclera on the other side of that mountain. Um, yeah, so these are sometimes called a Kachina, but when is a face? a face and when's a mask is a whole nother issue. Some people call this a kachina, but it looks like just the face. We do have other times where you have a bracket and you can see the mask. So in some of the iconography, you know for sure it's the, the entire mask. So it's a big debate, Laura, and I'm not doing a very good job answering it. Well, when there's a lot of accoutrement and a headdress and stuff, yeah. that would be more, yeah. you know, perhaps. And it kind of ties in, of course, to our research, Dr. Goodman's original research of looking at why artifacts and why drawings and why sculptures yeah, and why are they there? About. Why the, what why is it about? Because there's always Ancient significance. Art. It's never random. It's yeah. always an important. Purposeful. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Meaningful. Well, that is one interesting thing is that you know, we, from the Western perspective, don't understand the myths and the stories and every detail that says something. It's a detailed language that's communicative to that culture. And so, um, and just like with every indigenous, every, they know the meanings of this. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Is it like a pageantry that's played out certain times of year? The, the Katsinas, Kachinas, they're in a choreography performing the rites that are meaningful to help nature go through her emotions and in harmony and right action and right timing. There's, that's kind of the purpose behind it then, yeah. it seems. The, within, not just talking about any one particular tradition, but cross-culturally looking at these yeah. sorts of uh, mass dancers sorts of traditions cross-culturally, there's heavy theatrics that go along with them just in terms of the presentation, the movement, the synchronicity of um, actions. You can't just simply take a whole bunch of people and say, okay, go go out onto an area and, and do it. it. It takes some practice, it takes some coordination, which emphasizes the communal nature of these sorts of um, practices. It's they're and people the interacting unique. with each other and moving with each other, and not just simply as individuals. And the meaning behind ritual and, and dance and ceremony, mm. right? Because you could see on the walls of Egypt, they're laying out exactly what to do. Um, in the song lines of the Aborigine, they have a certain sequence and a certain ritual to activate yeah, the land. Sure. You can 
-hmm. you can just see this this yeah universal impulse to act it out theater look at the roots of theater look at the shaman of foitre foitre trough where cave oh, yeah. that you showed earlier on he's dancing a dance mm -hmm. right he's so purposely, absolutely yeah looking again more broadly in siberia there are traditions of among um sorry, uh, siberian uh natives where this is can be part of uh initiation ceremonies where people put on the mask go through some sort of a puberty rite to take off the mask and they're literally seen as a as a different person this transformational aspect uh, within that particular culture of yeah. of the mask is the means of transforming that person's uh spirit the, itself but also their social status their relationship with the community all sure. of that mm -hmm. those passages um speaking of siberia i just want to credit van jan van eiselstein working with the old she of siberia and looking at the collection of very primitive looking wooden figures that she right. had and she said these are carved specifically the way they've been carved for at least 15,000 years because when the spirits are called in to inhabit them, they must recognize them. They can't change the artwork. The artwork has to be the artwork. And if a crack appeared in the wood of one, that's an even uh, more significant artifact because it's already had the opening for the spirits to go in and out. Yeah, so that same uh that same tradition mm -hmm. yeah uh, and i also wanted to come back to, to the decommissioning of a mask that that christine you mentioned about the burying them outside uh was there any other style of decommissioning that happened i mean was it ever burned or done any different differently was it always done through burial or look at the bowls with the kill hole in the middle right yeah, to yeah. decommission a piece exactly. look in egypt they smash the noses of a statue right. they think the egyptians themselves right. did that but but specifically here in this tradition yeah. of the mask yeah. Um, leaning into Ed Ladd again, he talked just about a couple masks, the, the, the individual masks that will, uh, that belong to somebody, very specific masks being um, buried out. He also, in a movie that was narrated by Robert Redford by Anna Sofer, Ed yeah. Ladd is interviewed in that film, but oh. he talks about the breaking of pottery at the North Road, that when you break something and drop pottery, you're releasing the spirit and making it useful in the other world. So burying the mass uh -huh. is gonna make it useful in the other world. And he was very clear in that particular um, mm -hmm. discussion of the film, talking about that as well. Mm. Uh, Hopi, the butterfly whirls, the woman is so powerful that her godfather, she cannot touch her head or hair. And if it comes out, it's really bad thing. So her godfather makes her a scratcher to scratch. But the scratcher and the hair whirls are full of this power after her ceremony that mm -hmm. they are taken out along with the scratcher and the whirls and buried as well. And that's been recorded with Hopi. So we're seeing that. And then mm -hmm. other people, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, well, let me Rock just Pencil talks about with Pueblo, with a member's um, pottery at 81,000. She thinks the kill hole is um, for releasing that spirit as well. And she talked about that with JJ Brody. So yeah, we see that sensibility um, playing in different um, groups across the Southwest and then looking mm -hmm. at it back into time. Let me just share a comment from Bruce Bradley, who's an experimental archeologist now working at Exeter College, but he's an American. Uh, we got to spend some time with he and his wife, Cindy. And they were looking at, and they were actually, we attended a lecture right, right. of Bruce, a talk for just for us, where oh, yeah. he was napping yeah, a okay. Clovis point. Um, and he was describing how they would go out and see certain caches of the stone. They'd see napping sites. They'd see where they could put together a broken uh, point. And he said some of the most beautiful and elaborate, some of the best stone, he feels was intentionally broken ritually. And that was, I guess, what you just said, to send that power to be used, that object to be used in the next world. That explains it. He was actually puzzled by that. He said, why would you take your absolute most exquisitely accomplished point and ritually smash it and then leave it there? I guess that, that explains mm. it. Mm. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That belief. Yeah. Um, Always to make an offering, right? To to the... Tony had a couple of questions as well. Uh, Tony, you want to go ahead and ask your questions? 
Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, absolutely wonderful presentation. Yeah. And I, things were fresher in my mind a few years ago, but I'm thinking of discussions with David Brugge, uh, who um, was a good uh -huh. friend of mine and accompanied me uh, many times out to the site I was researching in Chaco. And he would tell me about the number of clans uh, that the Navajo share with, with the Pueblo people, which he believed was the aftermath of the Pueblo revolt, where the Pueblo fleed back to places like Chaco and Pineta, where, where the Navajo were. And, uh, and this was not for a year or two. He said, think 100 years sort of thing, many generations. So there was a certain uh, uh, overlap there. I'm wondering, um, uh, a couple of the figures you were showing, or one of the figures in particular, looked almost like a petroglyph uh, that I've seen in uh, Eastern Chaco. Oh, interesting. And uh, I'm just wondering, I think David might have commented on that. I'll, I'll have to look at my notes, and I actually have a video of, of him uh, walking around Eastern Chaco with me and, and annotating what he saw. I, I need to do something with that. But oh, I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if you have seen an overlap and how this works between the Navajo people and the Pueblo people. Hmm. Um, again, I had a lot of uh, Bill Hawk classes and Bill Hawk got his PhD out of UNM in the 1950s. Um, he spoke seven languages as Algonquin, amazing um, person. But wow. one of the things that he stressed as a poor grad student at UNM in the 50s, he did a little bit of salvage archaeology. And there are these sites that are now underwater at the reservoirs and other places that are governor door phase stuff where we see Puebloan style architecture with uh, the Diné Hogans and then Kivas. And so the 1700s archaeology is really amazing and it has where we can see as archaeologists wow that looks Puebloan and that looks at the Baskin and his sister married into Hamas and there are stories that Hamas sent several other most beautiful maidens to the Athabascan people because they were so worried about Spanish retaliation according to Hawk mm. and so we see that as as well and so I guess because I had as young undergrad having Hawk I I believe that is true and I think there is some evidence and I know that when one of our edited volumes we had Taft Black Horse who's Navajo um Jay Williams John Stein do an article and they felt because of the continuity with the relationships of the clans and with the mixing of what we would consider Puebloan and Navajo, what be will become Navajo, that they could understand Chaco. And so I know that's had a mixed review, but I, I was comfortable with that because even if it's not right, it needs to be dealt with. There are these deep relationships with Navajo and the Pueblo and world that work together in, in a way that can be understood by the by the indigenous people. Does that make sense, Tony? It makes every bit of sense. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. And another thing I couldn't help but notice, you mentioned that the Kachina began kind of right after the demise of Chaco. Right. Is, is there a relationship between that timeline? Absolutely. The um, Southwest has a lot of issues in the 1300s, and it gets so a lot of warfare, a lot of fighting, a lot of things were really rough, but it re coalesces in the 1300s to be a much more peaceful and a much more stable time period. And that goes into the historic occupation. And so I, I think it's the aftermath or whatever Chaco was. And you know, Tony, there are all kinds of debates by Chaco oh, yeah. scholars. And but one thing is for sure, what happens after the fall of Chaco is not at all what comes out in the in the 1300s. So it's definitely reorganization. And I would suggest we see it, the plazas start after Chaco, these huge plazas. What are plazas really good for? Public dancing, right? Yes. The kachinas, we see in the iconography, we see it in the pottery, we see it in the rock art. Mm -hmm. We see it with how this brand new settlement pattern begins. And I think that is part of the, I think there are streams from Chaco. There were things they learned and several people in Anna Fairs, um, the indigenous people, she's asking the Puebloans do a much better job talking about that. But there are stories that they still continue within 
the different pueblos of their cultural knowledge from Chaco remains with them. And one of the Zuni men say, we don't understand all those stories, but we know it's true. And so the themes are still there. They still have that knowledge, but it does create something new coming out of Chaco, this old and new continuing, according to the people she interviews in the, um, was it the, the Mysteries of Chaco? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the name of the film. Yes, uh, actually, actually the, um, this, this one of the sites I'm working, the principal one, Shabikashi. Oh, nice. I love Shabikashi. That's just yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, so, well, yeah. well, this is great. And it's not, it's, while I've done a lot of work at the Great Sun Shield, um, yes. the, the most interesting thing is actually a little bit west of that, uh, where there's, I think, a, a definitive um, sunrise, uh, winter, uh, December solstice sunrise phenomena. Wonderful. Uh, it's pretty definitive, and I'd be happy to talk more about it. I gave I'd be happy to help you with that, Tony. Uh, <laughs> sign right. me up. Sign me All up. Right. All right. And, I'd be happy and, to hear more yeah. about that, too. Yeah. 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 yeah, and and there are uh, all sorts of interesting things there, including what Brugge described in the area right behind the boulder that marks this, mm. a, a dance court. That wouldn't surprise me at all, actually. And the other thing I think that with the post Pueblo revolt is they had to take things into private places and up in the hills and hidden. That's what we did at Zuni, Governor Door phase archaeology at Zuni. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how well they were able to camouflage and hide things and do things behind boulders. Probably was happening before time because actually Alfonso Ortiz in his Tewa world talks about how the religious train, the made people, they go and do things at places on landscape that not everybody does and not everybody knows about, but there's all kinds of stuff by the made people going on in the Puebloan world, if you will, behind the scenes to keep the society going. Yeah. That's yeah. Alfonso Ortiz's work. That's a great book if you haven't read it, The Table World. Uh, yeah, I think we thank, have that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, good questions. I'm I just... going to invite Shoshana to open up your mic and tell us more about this, but I'll read what you say in the chat. My friend and documentary filmmaker Pat Ferrero made a wonderful film about Hopi culture titled Hopi, Songs of the Fourth World. Dr. Alfonso Ortiz wrote, quote, quite simply put, this is the finest documentary I've yet seen on a North American Indian people or subject. Oh, yeah. Tell us more. Hi, Shoshana. Hi. Well, I met Pat in the 70s, early 70s. We were very, very close friends. And I, she uh, was making this film, I think, in the 70s or the 80s. And we uh, actually went down to the Southwest and um, were in, able to go to some dances. She became friends with some of the people that um, that you mentioned and she- It's blurred. Can you move it I just know. for a second yeah. in front of Oh, there you go. Yeah. There put, you. put it in front of you for a moment. Just for oh, a moment. there. Yeah, there that's there. it. Thank you. We appreciate that. Hopi, Songs of the Four. Well, it's a beautiful film. She's a marvelous um, documentary filmmaker and studied uh, anthropology at San Francisco State and taught filmmaking there. Oh, nice. And um, let me just read a blurb here. Okay. Amidst okay. beautiful images of Hopi land and cult and life, a variety of Hopi, a farmer, a religious elder, grandmother, painter, potter, and weaver, they all speak about the preservation of the Hopi way their philosophy of living in balance and harmony with nature is a model to the Western world yeah. um, of an environmental ethic in action. So she has um, film footage of people actually planting the corn, harvesting the corn, um, the grandmothers playing with a couple of children out in the, on the land and um, Oh, many, many, many scenes. I think the film is organized around the four colors of corn, uh -huh. the white, the red, the blue, and the yellow. And so, but it's all in the first person. I mean, it's all in the voice of the people. She yeah. became friends with Fred Cabote and his family, and she was allowed to come in and photograph things that were um, up to then kind of, you know, private. 
I think there's a scene of a dance and I, I don't remember exactly. It's been what, 40 years now? I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. <laughs> she's I've never alive. heard of it, so I'm she's, really excited to get that. She's alive and well in Mendocino. Oh. And the film is, is uh, distributed through New, New Day Films. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank you That's so great. much. So Appreciate yeah. that. You know, the, the, I, and also I want to mention Bruce uh, Bernstein who works with the Pahaki tribe will be our guest on Sunday, August 7th. Right. And talking, he's an ethnographer, talking more about this relationship of bringing in more of the native voices to right. the, that, the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. I want to credit Ken Zoll with when he's deciphering and really discovering the VBRB heritage site as a solar calendar, bringing in the Hopi right. uh, voice to say, we, these are clan marks among the petroglyphs. Like so much. Let here me just that, add that in that shared adventure, and also talking about bringing in native voices. Um, you know, this is I think we've done a fantastic job of, of giving credit to the voices along, but we also open to some in-person live voices, and we put out some in, some uh, invitations, and so we'd love to have more of that as well to help to get both yes. sides. You know, one of the things about to Bruce, please bring a Puebloan person to talk. Which about Christine and Todd yeah. can verify, but we attended, and, and also Tony was with us. But the SAA meetings, this Society for American Archaeology, where they the the, the, the sophistication, the growth, the communication it's come to the point that they have to have both voices on stage yeah. sharing presentations. So you have the anthropologist and then you have the native person. The, the very you have culture. The archaeologist yeah. and then you have... So it, that, I love Scott that wonderful Bergman relation. So we would like to... address that as well and why he was chosen as the archaeologist to lead the project because he integrates right. the native voice. Good. So that's part of our um, mission as well. More native voices as well. Yeah. Bob had his hand up a second ago. It was up for a long time. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, oh, wait a minute. He, uh, had to, go? he must have had to leave because he's not on the list. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. He sorry was about that. Sorry, Bob. That, that would have been nice. Sorry, Bob. Um, anyway, uh, I do appreciate where we've come today, this conversation. And Christine and Todd, I love the fact that you are doing the homework and you're doing it correctly. You're, you're, you're citing your references properly. And also, you're taking That's us on a do. journey. They're professionals. You, you're taking us on a journey of exploration because we don't have access. And you know, we're not still at the university level going to classes. We'd love to go to your classes, Christine and Todd. But, um, but you know, thank you for bringing them here. Yeah, thanks for bringing them <laughs> to part. us. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's an ongoing, yeah. it's an ongoing cooperative relationship. And I, <laughs> does anyone else have questions before we end today? I didn't give. Make uh, yourself known. Open up yeah. your mind. Well, so I don't we know. Can see you. Yeah, or yeah. or at least raise your hand. But yeah. Well, I mean, and that's that's where we're at. And so this this discussion today for me kind of takes us full circle, where we can have that relationship and understanding and the sophistication, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and the cooperation of working with uh, with these. Um, indigenous cultures worldwide, that we can, we can do so with an appreciation, not an appropriation. We want to understand and, and put it in context. And hopefully as humanity, you know, I re, we had the great opportunity many times to interv interview um, um, Vine Deloria Jr. And he was uh, a native scholar, uh, an, an academic that could, could argue with anybody on any level in any discussion. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and, you know, he was his original book, God is Red, which is was was foundational to, to bringing forth uh, the native voice in in the uh, the field of uh, uh, um, educating people around the world. And um, he said a couple things. One is he said, you know, we've gotten to the point now that white people are thirsting. They're coming to me and they're asking me for the simplest form of, of ritual and understanding of what things are going on. He said, you know, I understand the fact that like, we, we don't want these, these guys taking our stuff. But there's also, we're at that point in time, too, that if we don't do something to help these white people with some direction. Get back on track. <laughs> get back on track. Who knows what they're going to do next? I so know. we have we have to we're share some of We're pretty dangerous on our own. We, we need to, to be brought back into the fold, we have right? To save some, we have to share some of the wisdom here because, uh, yeah, traditional well, you, knowledge. You mentioned this culture, that culture. It's a tapestry. You mentioned mm. the migrations, the exodus, the reintegration, the, the alliances. It's a tapestry. We in the West are part of that tapestry as well. And I think we need to be woven back in. We need to understand our lineage. We 
come from a lineage of indigenous mm. uh, cultures, right? If you dial it back farther, far enough, can we bring some of that wisdom forward? Right. Can we bring that world in a cooperative forward? way? Yeah. Can we can we reintegrate where all of the world sure. is sacred, right? Where mm -hmm. we have this personal direct relationship with the world around us? Can we enter back into right. sustainability and eco spiritual? Can we get back there? Can yeah. we? Can right. we integrate what we've done with technology and bring it back and, and do better with what our influence is? Every That's generation feels that they're at a crossroads, but I definitely feel that we're at a crossroads of where we can go different directions with the environment, what's happening politically, what's happening uh, overall, uh, and, just and in terms of our, divisiveness between us. So and look at our fractured worldview. And so we don't know about. much about the Tewa people, our neighbors there in Santa Fe. Right. But what I do know is it's a beautiful worldview it's an integrated worldview it's a sustainable it's honoring all of nature it's it's just beautiful and coherent and sophisticated right. mm -hmm. and wise right we need yeah we all need right. we need lessons that says it all <laughs> yeah uh, the, so. yeah perfect so Shona, you had your hand back up. Did you want to add something? Oh, I wanted, I wanted to say that the reason that the, the Hopi allowed Pat to film what they, what she did film was because of that very uh, philosophy that, it, that, that somebody had to document these, this culture before it to, it, things disappeared. And that was 40 years ago. Hmm. They wanted her to document some of the dances so look and at, things for the, today. the young wow. people. For the young, I just wanted to throw in at the very end. I don't know quite how this relates, but I know it does. Okay. Uh, in two to days. That, in two uh, days. To that too with uh, the Kabodis. Um, my Kabodi, he uh, told me, and he told many other people um, that he wanted healing for the world and healing for humanity. And a lot of what he did, so when I asked him if he could be a discussant for a couple of sessions, he said yes, but his artwork at the end of his life was all about healing and trying to bring people together. And I really wish he was alive. I've not really met his son yet, and he's very active, the third Kabodi that's an artist, but I need to reach out to him. But uh, what an amazing family. Um, yes. That, yeah, absolutely. So I'm looking forward to that film. Right. <laughs> um, I want to just throw this out at the very end and forgive me if it's not directly about what we're talking sure. about today in two days nasa is going to release pictures from the james webb telescope <gasps> oh, okay. that's and that is going to change our oh my gosh of right. our life on earth and our relationship <laughs> to the universe and we're gonna have to take a double you know think about this all over again right. and yeah. the great reset right to yeah. To understand, though, that the empowerment of we can engage, we can engage nature, we are engaging nature. Can we yes. do it in a respectful, honoring, yes. sustainable, uh, beautiful way? Can we take yeah. what's so wise about nature? Can we learn from her directly? We engage. Yeah. How are we engaging? We'll look forward so, to updates from yeah. Tony, who's going to be following. He said he's actually going to be speaking on this topic on Tuesday. So. Oh, okay, Tony, tell us. Well, update. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, well, the the updates are going to come out to us all on Tuesday morning, and I'll be giving a, a presentation at the Museum of Natural History Tuesday afternoon. But uh, which, and this this will be uh, broadcast by NASA, and and each institution will have their own kind of opportunity for. Uh, a gathering with questions and answering. So I'll, I'll be monitoring that. Uh, I have the privilege of leading the team that polished all the mirrors on web. So I've, I've oh touched, every, I've oh touched every one of those mirrors. How do we you find, how do we find your teacher? presentation? Well, I, I don't think, I don't think you will, but, uh, oh. but if you do have any questions, do let me know. Yeah, but uh, the, you'll not see much of me there. I'm going to be the web personality in Albuquerque, that's all. Because next Sunday I'll be making presentations in Montreal at the Astronomical Telescope Conference. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we we'll see you again, sometime, and we'll have our own Q and A. Very, you. very rude of you to have other opportunities to speak <laughs> other than here. I mean, you just... <laughs> we're not your first priority. Yeah. Okay. So, thank, uh, you. Listen, thank you. Thank you, Tony, for all the good work that you've doing. Again, thank you, Shoshana, for Shoshana, alerting us to the film. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine and Todd, for all your wonderful work, for yeah, for yeah. Um, yeah, enlivening and expanding our discussion for 
um, just all that you do. We appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, Thank really. Uh, as Laura says, moving the dial with dialogue, but it's even you guys are pushing us forward with understanding and also yeah. integrating both the world of science and the world of direct experience a lot in a of new way. To build, following yeah. in the footsteps of Dr. Goodman. Uh, he's, we really take a village, so this is really working <laughs> out well. I will say that when um, Paul first came to the, to the Institute, and he was, um, he had felicitous every morning. She'd have us get up, we'd go greet the sun. He has continued that tradition. He has been rewarded so much by continuing that tradition over the years. Mm -hmm. It has meant so much to him yeah. to, um, yeah. to begin that the dialogue and that relationship and deepen that in and, that and, way. And we all continue And that's to. really why we have the topic that we had today is because we were finding so much in the landscape, in the sky, mm -hmm. in dialogue, um, showing up. <laughs> so well, the greater, yeah. All Thank right, you. Van Pools, wonderful. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Blessings to you all. Bye. Thank Bye. you.